Welcome to Hoops High, Chicago's leader in youth-produced sports broadcasting and youth media education. Hoops High is produced by high school students learning the skills of professional broadcasting. Hoops High is the flagship program of Free Spirit Media and is made possible in partnership with After School Matters, the Chicago Public Schools, and Chicago Access Network Television. We hope you enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Michael Ingram. I'll be serving as a play-by-play -play for the evening. And I'm Ariel Pryor, and I'll be serving as your fellow commentator for the evening. We're here at the Golden Dome where we have the Falcons playing the Generals. It should, very, it should be a very intriguing basketball game. A lot of highlights I've seen doing the layup line, you know, dunks being thrown down, trick three-pointers. Trick three pointers. You know, the Generals, known as Farragut, and the Falcons, known as Prosser, had a pretty good regular season. You know, uh, one of Prosser's main, one of the, uh, I'm sorry, the Generals' main players, uh, Sai Carroll, went to, transfer and went to Orr. So this is a little bit of a summer league. So let, in this game right here, or plenty of other ones, we'll see how they plan on, you know, recruiting and see how they, how good they are without Sai Carroll, one of their main key players. And that's a floor action. Getting ready to jump ball is number 13, Adam Braxton. And number four, Ashawn Jones. Aria, hey, what are you looking forward to seeing in the game? I definitely see a lot of communication already. So I see a lot of key plays. I see, I can see some good defense going on. Some nice shots, good shots. Nice plays being played. Now, getting ready for jump. Ashawn and Adam in the middle. Ashawn wants to tip. Number one, bringing the ball up before Antonio Williams kicks it to Ashawn. Ashawn kicks it back to Antonio. Antonio kicks it to Amir. Amir dribbling. Amir kicks it to Antonio. And that was a bad pass. It wasn't a bad pass. Antonio just didn't get there in time. Number two with the ball for the Falcons. Darnell Latham Jr. dribble between the legs a couple of times. Crosses left and goes to the basket. And that's no good. Joshua Adams with the ball. Joshua behind the back. Joshua loses it. The ball is quickly stolen by number six. Number six pushing the ball up the court. Kicks it to a wide open number three down low. And number three, Tobias McGee Jr. With the first two points of the game, Joshua Adams with the ball. Kicks it to number 11. Number 11 with a little bit of a circus shot. Number 11, Anthony Mason. Number two with the ball. Kicks to number six. Number six, jab step. Number six kicks to number 13 for three. Number 13, that three is no good. Antonio with the ball. Antonio, who's a premier high flyer for the Generals, gets an easy layup to go off the glass. Antonio, who's a sophomore, played a little bit of varsity last year. Number two, Darnell with the ball. Darnell kicks to number 13. Number 13 on the drive, up fake, kicks it out to number six. Number six stops it, slows the ball down, cross back. Three and three seconds. Amir in, looking to inbound the ball. He kicks to his son. That bucket was no good. Darnell to the basket, kicks to number 13. Number 13 on the drive. That strip by Antonio. Amir is fouled by number three. 
Amir looking to inbound the ball, kicks to number three, Joshua. Joshua gets the ball poked away, but Antonio was right there to get it. Amir with the ball. Amir kicks it. Antonio with the ball. Antonio kicks it to Joshua. Joshua goes around the screen for Mayshawn. Joshua on the floater. Josh's floater is good. Number two, Darnell with the ball. He's semi-pushing it up the court. In and out. And that's oh. And the refs call a foul, but I seen a clean strip. So far, it's a good good game. Number two, Darnell for three. He's foul. Nothing's called. Antonio on the drive. Antonio kicks it out to Ashawn. Ashawn is called for travel. Ashawn, who used to, you know, help right alongside Carroll down low, is probably going to have to do it this year by himself. I'm not sure. But we'll see that further on in the school year. Number 13, three is off. And a over the back is called subs. Get ready, no, timeouts get ready to come to the game. And with that being said, I'm going to toss to a quick PSA. I want to be a teacher. I want to go to the outfit. I want to be a doctor. I want to be an actress when I grow up. People say I don't have enough knowledge. But people say I'm too weak. But people tell me I can't make it. But people say I never make it. Teamwork make the dream work. But I know my dreams can be reality. Be you. Stop being a dream killer. Be a dream instigator. Be a dream instigator. Be a dream instigator. Be a dream instigator. Amir inbounds the ball to number 11. Amir gets the ball back. Amir in and out. Amir needs to pass the ball for his eight seconds. Kicks it to Antonio. Antonio kicks it to Amir. Amir kicks to Antonio. Antonio kicks to Ashawn. Ashawn, who's a pretty good three-point shooter for a big man. Kicks to Antonio. Antonio kicks it. No, I'm sorry. Joshua gets the ball now. Joshua on the drive. Circus shot. He's fouled. And he'll go to the line for two free throws. Joshua Adams, who is a junior. He played a lot on varsity last year as a sophomore. Joshua for a second free throw, and that's no good. Darnell with the ball. Number two with a floater, number two. Number 22, I'm sorry. Kaylin Lewis. Hey, Sean's to inbound the ball. Kicks it to Amir. Amir on a drive, layup, and that's no good. Rebound by number six. Number six, 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 number one, number one travels. Hoops High is produced by high school students who are learning the skills of professional broadcasting. All of the camera work, announcing, and directing, and engineering is done by students. Antonio missed your layup. Great defense by number 11, uh, Anthony Mason. Number six gets the ball for inbound. Number six kicks it to number 22. Number 22 with a finger roll. Number 22, Kaylin Lewis. Ashawn with the ball. 
Oh, hey, Sean behind the bag. Man, that's quickly still. Hey, Sean kicks it to Amir. Amir kicks it to Antonio. Antonio kicks it back to Amir. Amir thought about pulling it. He didn't. Joshua with the ball now. Joshua kicks it to Sean. Hey, Sean couldn't handle it. Hey, Sean on the drive. It's on with a left hand layup, draws contact, and he'll go to the line for two. Hey, Sean to the line for two free throws. That free throw is good, giving the team a one point lead, set with the score being seven to six, with 12 minutes remaining in the first half. Free Spirit Media strives to give youth a voice so that we can inform and inspire others. Thank you for supporting our work. It's Sean for a second free throw, and that's good. He has both free throws. Kickball is called. Dynell kicks it to number four. Number four kicks it to number 22. Number 22, Kaylin. The airflow is no good. Great passing. Great pass from number three, Tobias McGee, to number one, Marquise Lindsey. They shine with basic big man tripping. It's not fast enough. It's quickly trapped. They shine gets the ball again. Deshaun kicks it to Antonio. Antonio kicks it to the big man, number 12, down low. And number 12, Darnell Jones, a freshman, gets it and one. And he'll go to the line for a free throw. Number 12 to shoot his first free throw. Well, his only free throw. First free throws up, and it's good getting this team a three point lead. Great hustle by number two, Mayshawn Hazley. Darnell with the ball. Ball kicks it to a right of a three point shooter. And that's good. Good three ball by number three, Tobias McGee. Number two, Mayshawn. Hi, my Shot name is Nate Layup is blocked. He's also a fellow basketball player. So, Keenan, how you And now we're going to toss to the South Island Porter. So, I would say that you play basketball as well. Is that correct? Yes. And you go to Curie. So, what made you want to get into basketball? How's basketball going to help you? Basketball is going to help me because it's going to provide a way for me to get to college and get an education. In the future, and thank you for this interview. We're going to toss it back to our announcers. Second free throw is no good. A lot of confusion is made right now. Number three with the ball, Joshua with his single shine. Mayshawn gets to Josh. Josh kicks it to Antonio. Antonio for mid-range game. Man, that's no good. And jump ball. Right 
Right now, Jersey almost coming. Area, how are you enjoying the game so far? Very intriguing, very intriguing. I see a lot of back and forth plays. So it's really neck and neck game. Only time can tell the outcome. Number two, Darnell with the ball. Darnell walking the ball up the court. He's making his move. Cross, goes right, cross back left. Mid-range, kicks it to number three and number three. Woo. Whoa. I don't know what they call, but that was a great pass from number nine, Tavares Robinson. Number two, Darnell with the ball. Darnell kicks it to a three-point shooter. That's no good by number nine. He gets it again on a drive. Great pass. Picks to number nine, I'm sorry. Joshua with the ball now. Joshua with the ball, walking up the court. Joshua seems to be getting a bit frustrated. Joshua the mid-range, and that's no good. Jump ball. Little go blue way. Who was fair? I mean the Jones. Great steal by number two, Mayshawn. Mayshawn on the floater, and that's no good. Great defense by the Generals. Not letting the Falcons get no type of breathing room. Great, another steal by Mayshawn. Mayshawn kicks it to Joshua for an easy layup. Mayshawn getting a steal and an assist within three seconds. Great defense by the general so far. Mayshawn with great defense. He gets called for a foul. Mayshawn Hazley, who's been everywhere on the court so far. He's only a sophomore. He played a lot of far south last year. Ariel, seeing that the Falcons are down three, wait, seeing the Falcons are down two, what do you think they need to do to come back? I just want to say they need to play together more. I can see a lot of distance on the team. I don't see a lot of communicating like I did at the beginning of the game. And they definitely have to calm down and think about their plays before they act on them. Second free throw is up, and that's no good. Joshua Adams with a rebound. Joshua is double team. Antonio, this is number 12. Antonio with the ball. Antonio, a high flyer, who goes in for a layup. I thought he was going to get a dunk. Great steal. Antonio with the ball. Joshua, they, the referee says it was a block. I seen him foul, but Mayshawn gets called for a foul. Antonio passed it to Joshua, hoping that Joshua was going to lob it to him. Keep up with game action and the Hoops High crew with Twitter. Just search Hoops High Free Spirit Media or FSM and follow us. Darnell with the ball now. The score is 16-12, General's way, with three minutes and 40 seconds left. Number 13. Number four on the drive, number four with a floater. That's no good. Number nine, jump ball to start. Joshua with the ball. Joshua walking the ball up the court. And a moving pick is called. Our key player of the game is Joshua Adams, a junior, number three. He plays for Farragut Generals.
Darnell with the ball. He's slowly walking up the court. Pull up mid range, and that's good. Nice three. Amir with the ball. Amir with a spin behind the back. Kicks it to Mayshawn. Mayshawn kicks it to number 11. Number 11 for three. And that's no good. Amir is, is on in for a rebound. Mayshawn on the drive. Mayshawn with a floater. And that's good. Darnell with the ball. Darnell on Mayshawn on Darnell. Darnell with the float, and that's not good. Amir with the ball. player of the game is Joshua Adams. He's a junior, and he goes to Farragut. And today their mascot is the Generals. Mayshawn for three. He gets set to go. Darnell for three. And that's no good, trying to come back with a three of his own. That didn't work out so much. Amir with the ball. Amir kicks it to Mayshawn. Mayshawn on the drive. Two is called, number two is called for a foul. Subs coming into the game. Score is 21-14. I'm sorry, uh, General's Way. Amir with the ball now. Amir with the spins. Brings it back for some reason. I don't know why. She just kept going. This just happened so fast. Mayshawn with the ball. Sean kicks it to number 12. Oh, number four trips. He hurts his ankle. Hurts his ankle. Bad. Number four injured himself. Number four on. And the injury time I was taken. Try to make sure he's okay. He's walking to the bench under his own strength. You know. Kind of looks like he blew his knee out. Yeah. Great pass, number two. Number 22 with the easy bucket, Kaylin Lewis. Amir with the ball. Amir, is Amir going to beat the buzzer? Oh, he doesn't get that to go. This is a very good half. What you think about it? I'm here at the half of the Farragut Generals in the Prosser Falcons game. Farragut seems to be winning this, this half right now, winning this game at this half right now. impressive half though. Like I said, it needs more communication. It'll be a better half, better second half. What do you think, Mike? It was a great half. A, bit, a lot of highlights. That's what I really liked about it. Mm -hmm. A lot of teamwork going on between the generals, you know. Um, the Falcons are trying to seem, seem trying to make a comeback, you know, move the ball up, shooting a lot of threes, passing the ball to each other. That's pretty good basketball. That's what I like. You know, not so many highlights, you know, just playing together. And with that being said, I'm going to toss to my sideline reporter, Jeanette Tate. Well, we're not playing hard, a lot of turnovers, just no energy at all. So what techniques do you plan to use to, you know, keep your boys in the game? Well, defense is the key. If we don't play defense, we're going to score the basketball right now. Because I got a bunch of young guys playing, so we got we to gotta play some defense. Right, because you got to, you know, stop the team, right? Right, right, right. right. Uh, see, I understand. There you go. But well, thank you so much, and I wish your team good luck. Right, thank you. We're going to send it back to our announcers.
And we're back with more hoops I like and we're back with more hoops I action, ladies and gentlemen, for just tuning in. I am Michael Ingram serving as your play by play. And I'm Aaron Pryor serving as your color commentator for the evening. We're here at the Golden Dome where we have the Generals and the Falcons getting ready to take on each other in, for the second half. The Generals who have been taking a commanding lead under number three Joshua Adams and number two Mayshawn Haley who's been really going nuts in the first half, you know, getting a lot of threes up, driving to the basket. Number six, Trayvon Boyce to take the ball out. Darnell with the ball. Darnell on the drive. Layup, that's no good. Joshua Adams with the ball, but Joshua pushing it up. Joshua to the basket. But that's no good. Number six. Number six on the hand of the ball. The ball goes off his knee. Trayvon Boyce. Antonio kicks it to Amir. Amir kicks it to Antonio. Antonio stops, kicks to Ashan. Ashan. Drive step and shine to the last one. He's blocked. Antonio with the ball. Antonio with skin. That's no good. Darnell with the ball now. He's walking the ball up the court, trying to read the floor. Let's see what kind of moves he made. Darnell kicks it to a three-point shoot, number three. Number three, his three is no good. Number one, Antonio with the ball. Antonio kicks it to Joshua. Joshua kicks it to Amir. Amir kicks it to Ashan. Ashan shot is up, and that's no good. Antonio with the rebound, that's no good. Darnell Jones, the freshman. Joshua Adams with the layup. Darnell Jones with the steal. He'll be credited with the steal as he posts it away. The PSAs, dramas, and documentaries that you see between breaks on Hoops High are produced by Free Spirit Media. Students at North Lawndale College Preparatory High School, the Gary Comer Youth Center, and Powerhouse High. We hope that you enjoy the stories and messages that we young people are sharing. Number 13, the line for two free throws. First free throw is up, and that's good. Adam Braxton Jr. First free, second free throw is up, I'm sorry. That's no good. Number two, number 22 gets the rebound. Hits number six. Number six kicks it to number three. That's no good. Ashawn kicks it to Joshua. Joshua with a step back. That was a pretty good step back. And number six turns his back. To Joshua and Joshua will be called for a call. Number two, number number three on the drive. And that's no good. He gets his own rebound tip in. That's good. Number three, Tobias McGee Jr. Trying to bring his team back right now. And Sean tries to dribble. Subs coming into the game, 11. Anthony Mason comes in for number 12, Darnell Jones. And Please check out the Free, Media, Free Spirit Media website at www.freespiritmedia.org to learn what Free Spirit Media is all about. Or check us out on YouTube. Search Free Spirit Media to view our YouTube channel. 
and the time out is taken. And with that being said, I'm going to toss to a quick POC. I'm be turning all these heads at the game tonight. Shortybad.com. 75% of teenagers will have had sex by the time they are 20. Girl, where you going? Flip gang. You like my makeup? Uh, yeah, I guess. I'm gonna get too many shorties numbers tonight, man. First of all, you got on too much makeup, and you need to get your priorities straight. Boys is not the only thing in life. Where are you tripping? U.S. teenagers are more than likely to have sex before the age of 15. This is the female student mentor class. I really think you would like it here. It's where girls help other girls build their self-esteem. Number three, Joshua Adams with the ball. Pass fake, kicks it to Amir. Amir kicks it to Ashawn. Ashawn for three. That's no good. Antonio with the rebound. Antonio power dribble. He's fouled. And number 22, Kaylin Lewis is called for a travel. Sean calls for the ball and he gets it. And Sean dribbles. And Sean with a float in. That's good. Number six. He dribbles through his legs. Passes it. Probably dangerous cross court pass. Amir with the ball. Amir kicks it to Josh. Josh thought about it. Pulls it back out. He didn't have anything. They shine with a crossover. Oh, number 13 for the dunk? No good. Well, he gets the easy layup. Amir with the ball. Amir pushing up the court case to Josh. Josh is called for a track. For a travel. Number three is trying to get in. Number three, Tobias McGee is trying to get in. Number one, Antonio Williams here. Danielle kicks it to number six. I'm here at the Farragut Generals and Prosser Falcons game. The score is 25 20 with Farragut in the lead. Number 13 gets a rebound. Mid range, that's no good. Great defense by Sean. Number 22 misses a layup. Number 13 gets a rebound. This is too many offensive rebounds. The general should be trying to close out and box out. Number three gets that, and that's no good. Another offensive rebound by the Falcons. That was too many opportunities. What do you think that was too many opportunities? Antonio dunk. Oh! Antonio with a two-hand dunk. That'd be a great replay. Antonio makes it look easy. I told you guys he was a premier high flyer. He just makes it look easy with the two-hand dunk right there. Hey Sean, will A Sean get a dunk? A Sean finger roll. Number three with the ball. Ashawn with the great defense. Ashawn, Ashawn pokes it away and the ref calls a foul. I know Ashawn was by himself and Ashawn would have definitely dunked that one. And with the timeout being taken, you see right here on the replay. Oh wow, they cut the replay short. Antonio made it look easy with super hops. He got up there and dunked it. See right there, Antonio dunks. Ariel, what did you think about that dunk? Did you think he was going to go up I would, did not expect that. Yeah. He doesn't look like he has hops like that. Yeah. I mean, I've seen him touch rim, you know, at least try to dunk. I've never seen him 
get up that high, Definitely. especially off a pro hop to dunk like that. Mm, Shout key. out to number one, Antonio Definitely Williams. For a sophomore to be dunking like that, it would be pretty hectic to see what he do his junior and senior year if he develops a little bit of game, you know. He's definitely made it look easy. How are you enjoying the game so far? It's really in interesting. Definitely a lot of back to back action. It's a really close game, like I said before. Only time can tell. <laughs> Out of bounds. Um, the Prosser Falcons. Number 11 with the ball, kicks it to Mayshawn. Mayshawn kicks it to Ashawn. Mayshawn is, du is double team. Joshua kicks it to Mayshawn. Mayshawn kicks it to Joshua. Joshua for three, and that's no good. Don't forget to stay tuned for the Free Spirit Media News at the end of this broadcast. It comes on at 9.50 p.m. every Saturday. Learn about what's going on in Chicago and find out the latest on the most important issues with teens. Good three ball by Darnell Lincoln Jr. Steal by Marquise. Joshua with the ball. Joshua splits the defenders. Joshua kicks it to Mayshawn. Mayshawn for three, and that's good. Mayshawn comes back with a three of his own. Darnell for three. And he hits. This is starting to become a three slug fest right now. Hey, Sean kicks it to number 11. Number 11 gets that to go. Marquise Lindsey with the ball. Number two with the ball. Joshua Adams playing great defense. Number two loses the ball. Number two with a shot, and that's no good. Number two. With that, he's constantly getting shots. No one's closing out. No one's trying to box out. Everybody wants to stay back. And with that being said, number two, Darnell gets the, gets the easy you know, shot. Timeout being taken. Timeout is being taken. How, how do you, with the score being 34 or 32, what do you think both teams need to do to, you know, take this win home? I definitely think the team that is in the lead needs to continue doing what they were doing, the taxes that they were doing. But if the team who is losing wants to win, they definitely, like I said, have to communicate. And I'm sure they can they can take home a win. Just got to work hard. Amir to inbound the ball. Amir stuck. Amir this is number 11. Subs coming into the game right now. Darnell with the ball. Darnell waves the ball. Now I'm going to toss to my sideline reporter, Jeanette Tate. Triple team throws the ball out of bounds and pushes card. The sign is being held. Now we will toss it to our sideline reporter, Jeanette Tate. Lucas, so you want to hate that the game is going so far? Uh, the game is going exciting. You know, they're giving it their all. 
Uh, especially that dunk. That was a nice dunk by Boomer. I think y'all should replay that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so too. So I understand that you play for Urban Prep, right? Yes. So how do you think basketball is going to help you in the future? Basketball is going to help me a lot because it's going to keep me off the streets, keep me in something to do, and I'm going to just focus on my on my education. That's really great. Do you think that you're going to, you want to be in the NBA? Yes. That is very exciting. I hope you for the best, and thank you so much for this interview. My name is Jeanette Tate. I'm going to toss it back to our announcers. And we're back with more hoops time, ladies and gentlemen. If you just tuning in, once again, I am Michael Ingram, so you now as a play-by-play. -play. Hey, Sean on a drive, and he's fouled again. Hey, Sean has to, I see now, hey, Sean's have to finish with contact. You know, minimum contact, major major contact. You know, putting put more points on the board for his team. First free throw is up, and that's no good. We were watching Hoops High. We were at Golden Dome where we have Farragut Generals and Prosser Falcons. The score is 35-32. And Farragut is in the lead. Rashawn hits his second free throw. Number six kicks it out. Darnell for three, and that's no good. Number three gets the rebound, and that's a block. Number two, Darnell, pass fakes, hop steps, goes to the basket. Hey, Sean comes up with the ball. Hey, Sean was about to do it behind the back. He couldn't get his hand on the road. Darnell misses. And great strip by May Sean. Number three, that was a bad pass. Darnell on a drive, kicks it to number one, Marquise, Marquise for three, and that's good. Nice shot. Number four, Mayshawn splits three defenders. Step back, and that's no good. Number one, Marquise kicks it to number three, number three with a mid-range, and that's good. Giving this team a lead, 37-36. Amir with the ball. Amir runs middle. Amir kicks to Ashawn. Ashawn kicks it back to Amir. Amir kicks it to Mayshawn. Mayshawn for three. And that's good. Giving his team a lead, 39-37. If you just can't seem to get enough of Hoops High, Friend us on Facebook. Get to know the crew and what goes into every Hoops High production. Technical foul. Oh, wow. A foul and technical foul was called. Another tech is called. Technical foul, that's a first. Another tech is called. How many techs did you I think like two or three techs you just called. All on the process coach. All within a few seconds. <laughs> Joshua Adams to the line for shoot, to shoot the technical free throws. Ball never lies. That's no good. Joshua just had to capitalize. He's clutch free throws, and he misses two. What are your thoughts on that technical foul? I think the coach could have calmed down a little bit, but I mean, I, I feel him on his point. It shouldn't have been a foul on his team. 
but no, it happens. Like I said, the ball never lies. How do you feel about it? I think he should have controlled his anger because that tech could have, it could probably cost his team the game. If he makes the free throw. Yes. Free throws make or break a game, and the Generals has missed three straight free throws right now. Joshua Adams missing two. Mayshawn hitting one of two. Giving his team a, yeah, I'm sorry, one of four. Oh, wait, he gets another free throw. And that's good. He gets another free throw. All these texts. Wow. Mayshawn has really been playing his heart out this game. A lot of threes, steals, strips, all of that coming up with it. Antonio kicks it to Joshua. Joshua drives, kicks it to Antonio. Joshua was fouled. On the pass, nothing was called. Number three, double teams quickly come. Darnell on the drive, and Darnell is fouled. The other Darnell getting ready to check into the game for the Generals, Darnell Jones, who's a freshman. Number two, Darnell Lincoln. Kicks it to Joshua. Joshua taking his time, bringing it up the court. Joshua with a challenging shot, and he gets that the way. Amir with the Amir on it with the great defense. Kicks it to a wide open number 22 down low. Joshua with the ball. Joshua splits B. Joshua with a pull up. And that's no good. We know we are not always Lanelle perfect, Jones gets a but rebound. we are working hard and always learning. We thank you for your support and encouragement. Number two, Joshua kicks it to Amir. Amir kicks it to Antonio. Antonio on a drive floater with a count, and it's good. Free throw is off. Number six on the drive, and he's fouled. Antonio with the ball. Antonio kicks it to Ashawn. Joshua with a step back. That doesn't work. Want to see more hoops high? Now you can see full games on our brand new website.
Go to www.hoopshigh.org to see games from the past or stream live from your home, from your home or your mobile device. Oops, high. Number two, Darnell with the ball. Oh, Darnell crossback spin. Great defense, number three for three, and that's no good. Number 22 with the rebound. Number 22 is fouled by Amir. It's great foul by Amir. Make him all earn those two points at the line. Number 22 to the line for two free throws. I know his jersey says number two, but it's him and Darnell Langham. It's both wearing number two. So Darnell put Kaitlyn down as number 22. So I do know my numbers. Number 22 for a second free throw, and that's good. Trimming his team deficit down to two. Antonio with the ball. Antonio in and out. Kicks it to Amir. Amir kicks it to Nashawn. Nashawn kicks it to Amir. Amir slowing the ball down at half court right now. Kicks it to Nashawn. Nashawn kicks it to Amir. Amir kicks it to Josh. Josh on the floater. That's no good. Amir with the rebound. Amir on the drive. That's no good. Antonio with the putback, and that's good. Seems Antonio's been fired up. Joshua with a re Joshua with a steal. I want to give a shout-out to Hoops High and, and everyone who plays a part in our show. You can check us out, you can check us out at hoopshigh.org. Thank you. Antonio with the ball. Antonio kicks it to Josh. Josh kicks it back to Antonio. Antonio kicks it to Nashawn. And see the general's just going to hold the ball right now. Amir with the ball. Amir kicks it to Antonio. Antonio kicks it to Amir. Oh, Amir with a shake. Joshua for three, and it's good. Great way to end the game. Joshua shoots and just takes the jersey off. Darnell for three, and that's no good. After Joshua shot the three, he just took his jersey off and said it was over with anyway. Thanks from the Hoops High crew. And I'm going to toss it to my sideline reporter, Jeanette Tate. No, we're not going to toss it just yet. Great game. What do you think about the game so far, Ellie? What did it you was, think about the game thus far? It was a good game. Like I said, on Tom, well, only time did tell about the score. It was really, really, really neck and neck. Great game, great game, great game. And now I'm going to toss it to my sideline reporter. Wait, not yet. You're tricking us over here. And now I'm going to toss to my sideline report, Jeanette Tate. Hi, my name is Jeanette Tate here with two players of the game from Farragut. I'm here with Antonio and Nashawn. So how does it feel to be player of the game? Uh, it feels good. I ain't had a player of the game in a long time, so it feels good for me to be playing good. <laughs> what about you? It feels good because it's my first one. Oh, that's nice. So what do you guys think your team could have, you know, did better in the game? We could have played defense better and rebound better. That's it. What about you? Same thing. Same thing? Yeah. So, 
Uh, what skills did you guys work on the most this game? Was it defense, offense, trying to stop the other team? What was it? I worked on driving to the hole and finishing at the basket. Okay, and what about you? Playing defense and getting my confidence up. Now that sounds really great, and congratulations to you guys both. Thank you for watching Who's Side Catch us every Saturday night at 8 o'clock on Can TV Channel 19. You can watch Hoops High on Can TV Channel 19 every Saturday at 8 p.m. Please visit www.hoopshigh.org to learn more. Hoops High and Free Spirit Media would like to thank our sponsors. We are grateful for their support in making our mission of youth media education and opportunity possible. Hoops High is family communication. Enjoy it. Hoops High is astounding. Creativity. Commitment. Hoops High is exciting. Meaningful. Hoops High is technology. Spirit. A community. Hoops High is home. Love. Dedication. Inspired. probably never was exposed to it, they probably would have never have done it, but it's something that you see that interests people a lot. I never worked with a camera, you know, it was my first time learning about a camera, you know, zooming in, zooming out. It was a real good experience for me, you know, I think it changed a lot in me too, it changed my how I think, and it changed like something I like to do in life. When I get older, I want to be some type of actor, so being in this classroom really helped me out, really exercised my ability to act. We shooting it, and we shoot it off like, what we didn't been through and like people get to see it and they watching it and they liking it. Like young kids in the community can do stuff that's like worth some type of value. Meet Jaden, a 16 year old from Chicago. He likes reading, playing basketball and daydreaming. As one of 75 million youth in America, he is the future of our country. But today, Jaden's future is uncertain. A new economy is evolving as Jaden tries to find his way in a school system where more than 42% of students drop out and even more fall behind. For Jaden and others like him, the future looks grim. But there is hope. Youth media programs connect with kids like Jaden, moving them from discouragement toward opportunity through the power of communication. Jaden learns about journalism, technology, and culture. He spends his time engaged at school, in youth centers, and at libraries. He discovers how to observe the world around him and share his own stories. He becomes one of more than 10,000 teens involved in the Chicago Youth Voices Network, a collection of innovative programs that come together with a bold vision to reach more people like Jaden, to transform education, and to shape the health of our city. Together, the network gives vision to the journalists, artists, engineers, and leaders of our future. One story, poem, film, blog post, one youth at a time. But you're rocking with Amari Stoudemire, and you're watching Hoops High. Watch it or watch nothing. Behind the scenes of Hoops High, it's more than interviews and replays. The crew contributes 110% in setup and production. While we have fun, we are also very serious about getting the job done. 
we have the opportunity to work with big companies such as Nike and to meet current and future NBA stars. We are Hoops High. What's up? How you been feeling? My name is Astaria Perkins. Good morning. How are you today? My name is Nicole Howard. What's up? How you be feeling? My name is Marisha. It's not so correct here. How you be feeling? I don't think that's good ebonics. Language is about communication. And it's communicating with at least one other person or entity. So uh, it, it, the words you choose, the words you use, the order in which you put words in, um, when you, whether you have inflection, what part of the sentence you have inflection with, it tells a lot about, I think, who you are. I grew up in an all-black hood community. All I was used to was my language. But throughout my teenage years, I am facing a lot of barriers that made me think, is the way I speak is wrong? I think language is the foundation of society. When you think about the way we communicate, um, rules, procedures, whether they're spoken or unspoken, it all involves language. How you talk, you know, it shows where you're from. Like, you know, people got accents. Like, Chicagoans have accents compared to somebody who live in Indiana, Ohio. Like, it's, it's, what makes us distinct from everybody else. African-American English is basically the non-standard way that African-Americans speak at home or among themselves, especially the people that have not had the privilege of um, pursuing higher education. My sister and I grew up in two different households. She stayed with my mom and I stayed with my dad. At my mom's house, they speak more proper. Well, I grew up at my dad's house, and we speak that black talk. Well, basically, I grew up in the Cabrini Greens, which was a project, and it was the ghetto, so most people spoke Ibonics. I ended up coming to North London my freshman year, and I ended up moving back with my grandmother. And when I came here, I mean, it's an urban community, so I felt like, you know, I was at home. Some cultural groups, we, you know, we speak loud. Uh, and, and some may um, interpret that loudness as anger. And, it might, and it's not necessarily anger. So there's a kind of a cultural disconnect there. I speak, I, I think I speak more proper when I'm at home. Because it's like, I know nobody going to look at me like I'm crazy or something. Students learn what they hear the most. So whatever they hear from home, they're going to bring that with them, those understandings to the school setting. It can be a liability uh, to speak African-American English in some settings because you become stigmatized, okay? Uh, but, you know, you, it's usually a liability to use the wrong kind of language in the wrong place. Last year, when I moved back at my mom's house, every time I speak, my sister had a problem. She always tells me that the way I talk isn't right, and I shouldn't speak like that. She is a speech therapist, and she thinks I won't go nowhere in life using that kind of language. Before I came to North Lindell, I guess I talked like an Oreo, you know. I talked proper before I came here. An Oreo is a black who talks white. Black on the outside, white on the inside. And like, it just made me feel like I didn't belong, so I had to adapt to how things were at North London. We are in a system where Ebonics, like non standard Southern English, like Appalachian English for that matter, these varieties are not accepted in the upper socioeconomic strata of the society. Before. Before, asked, ask, this, this, ain't, isn't. The origins of Ebonics, the simple way to answer the question is it is English of the 17th and 18th century as spoken especially in the South. And it became associated with African-Americans largely thanks to Jim Crow, 
when um, African Americans in the South with the Great Migration came to the North and Northerners were not familiar with the Southern way of speaking English and they heard this particular dialect of English which is basically Southern English in the mouths of African Americans and they characterize it as Black English. Then at some point people call it African American English and at some point people call it uh, Ebonics. When I was younger, it was okay that I spoke in Ebonics, but as I get older, I realized that my language wasn't getting valued in certain settings. Well, schools have their own culture in and of themselves. Um, in the United States, uh, schools, a model of schooling is really based on a white middle class um, orientation, and schools have a culture where we, we know that in schools, kids are expected to behave a certain way, speak a certain way, raise their hand. That's a culture in and of itself. I would not condone a teacher who would demean or degrade a student because of their use of abonics. Uh, that teacher needs to be able to grow that student from solely using abonics to using standard English. People thought that if African American English is used in the school system, it is a rejection of standard English. That's not what people meant. What people meant was if you talk to an African American kid in a dialect that he understands because it's the same dialect that is used at home. That makes it easier for the kid to learn every subject matter in the classroom, including standard English. I think that Ebonics is spoke more in school because it's so many. It's more kids than teachers. Like, throughout the day, you always, because you always see a student. You may say, what's up to a student in the hallway? because it's what they used to, it's their lingo. And it's like, when you're in a classroom, half the time, some teachers won't call on you, or you don't really get that attention, so you don't really have a need to you know, speak proper. If teachers can understand sort of the syntax or the rules that govern Ebonics, it'll make for an easier transition for those teachers to instruct students in standard English acquisition. Even though my sister is a speech therapist, she didn't understand where I was coming from. I felt like every time I came around her, I didn't want to talk. I didn't feel comfortable speaking proper. It just wasn't me. There's a way in which correction needs to happen. And uh, I think that when children are corrected all the time and constantly told that the way they speak is wrong, a child will either shut down, develop self-doubt about themselves, and kind of, and if they're in school, I think they disengage from school. I think school becomes a space that they're not interested in being in because it's a space that's telling them, you don't fit here. I can't change how I speak for someone else's satisfactory. So when you tell me that I can't speak a certain way, you're taking a part of me. I think it takes finding oneself in a position where one becomes uncomfortable because of the way they are being treated by others in order to realize how harmful negative stereotypes can be. I love speaking in Ebonics. I can't change who I am as a person for someone else's well-being. I found out it's not that I was speaking wrong. I had to tell my sister I know when and where to use my language. We do live in a global society, so not just learning standard English, but also learning other languages that are spoken around them, having some basic understanding is in everyone's best interest. I think we have to look at what we would call in the sciences a within group or emic approach, where we just understand a language in and of itself, for itself, not in comparison to something else. Normal human population is diverse internally. It includes variation and we don't always have an explanation for why we vary one from the other and we have to respect variation. As an African-American young lady the way I speak shows who I am and where I'm from. I'm proud of who I am and where I'm from. Going through this process I found out I wasn't wrong. It's nothing wrong with me. Man, this test hard. Let me see your test. 
Hey. What? You got a dollar? Thank you. Hey, can I get some of your chips? Man, you bag too much, hell. Dang, you could have saved me some more. But hey, let me see the ball. Hey, man, on the real though, you got to stop begging so much. <sighs> Come on, man. I mean, you got to be independent and not codependent. You know what? You right. I remember the days way back when I was a child. There was a monster in my closet. Scared to open the doors, afraid of what might be there. There was a monster in my closet. Like an evil monkey, he hunted me and watched my every move. Afraid to tell my mom what was going on, I sat back in silence. There was a monster in my closet. He only came out at night, afraid to show the sun his face. If he did, dogs would bark, birds would chirp, and sirens would sound. And then there was the darkness. There's a monster in my closet. Trying to run away, hiding under the covers, but nothing can stop him. I try to hide in his domain, but he has removed the door. So where will I go? There's a monster in my closet. Sexual abuse is a major concern in America. This issue is affecting families across the nation. It's a pretty prevalent issue. Um, and I think what happens is that sometimes you see it being as a cycle. Um, a lot of it comes from familial, uh, meaning family issues. Um, usually the perpetrator is somebody who's lived in a household. 90% child sexual abuse happens within uh, with people you know. I mean, I think that definitely at the root of child sexual abuse is a history of it. I think in a lot of different abuse, I see such a pattern of, well, this happened to me, you grow up, and even though you thought it was wrong as a child, it still is so ingrained in you. So I think definitely part of it is realizing that, that folks who are abused do need help. Because the effects of childhood sexual abuse can be so hurtful, it is critically important that we try to find ways to stop abuse from happening. When a child comes in, um, they may be acting up, they may be having difficulty in school, they may be withdrawing from family. Um, there's maybe some suspicion that there's some stuff going on, but sometimes you don't know. And, and sometimes things that kids show in terms of um, reactions to sexual abuse looks like other things too. I mean, it could be other stuff going on in their life. I mean, it ranges because working with teens versus working with at, uh, children are different um, where they are developmentally. So the manifestations of child abuse can look different. Um, the sexual child abuse looks different. I didn't deal with my sexual trauma from childhood until I was an adult. But going to therapy and particularly working with um, therapists, psychologists who specialize in sexual trauma has been one of the most rewarding and most um, transformative experiences of my life. My sister uh, told me that she was sexually assaulted. I was the first family member that she told. And so um, in response to that, I didn't really know how to help her, as so many people, when they hear somebody that they loved, um, has been sexually assaulted. And she told me that she, wasn't sex she was sexually assaulted twice. My senior year, I made this big performance about my sister's healing process, using my own photographs from that initial story, um, redocumenting her, and using music and art. Um, and now, me and my sister, we started the nonprofit together, um, and we've used that story, and we've gone to over a hundred different colleges and universities, like talking about her healing process, but how to end sexual violence, which I think we often don't talk about, like the healing process. Sometimes we talk about the assault itself, but not how people have to put the pieces back together after something like that has happened. Children who have been sexually abused face too much pain to bear the emotions by themselves. Because um, children don't have this uh, level of verbal uh, sophistication that adults have, art therapy is one of the primary mediums to use with young people or young children because of their verbal um, ability, right? So a child might not be able to say how something makes them feel, but if you have them draw it, and you talk about that, then you can get a lot of different ideas. And you can both diagnose children um, through that, but also help them heal. As a diagnostic tool, it's, it's helpful to watch what they do 
um, with their toys um, or in their art, if they do art therapy. In terms of treatment, um, a lot of times I've used puppets, you know, and kind of that's a safer way to kind of talk about things that are uncomfortable. Usually it goes unnoticed because usually the victim is scared to even share what has happened. What happens, especially in the school system, you pick up on behaviors, whether it's the child or the adolescent, that gives you kind of a clue that something has happened, you know, that kind of opens up the doors to have further conversation um, about what may be triggering um, that child to have, you know, to, to behave in such a way. If you're a young person and you haven't heard anyone else even mention that this is happening, you're probably feeling like you're the only person. So I think just getting awareness out, starting to talk about it, having a dialogue around these issues, and letting young people know this is, this is not okay. If this is happening to you, you can come forward, you can talk about it. We just have to start having these honest talks about it, right? Um, like, we have to break those silences. We have to believe survivors once they tell their stories about being sexually assaulted. Schools and communities can build awareness for preventing child sexual abuse by talking about it and, and being able to have it not feel like it's something that um, is shameful, um, creating space for kids to, to, to go, whether it's groups, and not just that for survivors, I mean, even just groups for kids who want to go and talk about something happening in their home. Childhood sexual abuse isn't a topic that is often discussed, especially with children. In order to prevent childhood sexual abuse, children should be more aware and more knowledgeable about this topic. I do think people's religious practices or, or their spirituality, however they choose to define it, can help them. I think friends and family can be a really important resource, and especially if the people believe them and are trusting and help them through their healing process. I think uh, your community, however you describe it, but oftentimes friends and family, um, are the ones that can, and your therapist and your spiritual uh, counselor can help you get through the trauma and um, somehow get through that process and come out on the other side and, and be someone that we call a survivor. Watch nothing. I think dolls are a good way for any child, girl or boy, to learn how to be creative and make up stories and kind of explore life through make-believe. Dolls are actually very important for children. Dolls become a way for children to develop an imagination. I think dolls and play um, are both good things and that it's, it's pretty natural throughout history and around the world. Like having dolls and having miniature representations of ourselves is, is, is something that's, that's healthy for, for young kids to play with and, and grow up with. What type of dolls do you play with? Um. 
Barbie. Why you play with Barbie? Because they are fun. I used to play all the time though with Barbies. I had Japanese Barbies, which don't look Japanese, they look American. And then I had American Barbies. I play with um, dolls with more themes, that way I didn't have to purchase the clothing that came with them. They already came in a the theme, like maybe the Christmas edition or the, the, the Halloween Barbie that had her costume. And I also play with paper dolls as well because they gave me a little bit more creativity. When I was five, I think that I liked Barbies. Then I thought she was the, the thing. I thought she was hot stuff. She had like nice heels, the fly boyfriend, jewelry, clothing. My impression of Barbie then was she was, you know, fun, pretty, um, always had a good time, you know, had all the nice cars, all the nice clothes. And I think I played my, my hopes and dreams, I think, for myself, like into the dolls. Guys, picture of a girl. Picture of a girl. They're cute. What's cute about them? Mm, the clothes. What do you like about their clothes? Um, that sometimes they um are gold. That they're the color of gold. Barbie, to me, um, has always been totally useless as a doll. Um, Barbie cannot stand up by herself. Um, Barbie has to be dressed um, and dressed in a very particular way. Historically, the Barbie doll has been, has uh, set sort of trend marks for women as far as like Barbie was, there was an astronaut Barbie. There have been different kinds of Barbies that have been released that sort of speak to uh, both women's disenfranchisement and the struggle that women have and also speaking to kind of the advancements that women have made. When I see these Bretts dolls, I believe they are a little inappropriate, more in terms of uh, the makeup, the high short skirt, the mini dress, the boots, the heels, the lipstick. And that to me is very suggestive of like their activities or what, um, what's being said about not only the doll, but maybe who plays with them and what society thinks they're going to grow up and become. Our young girls play with these dolls and the dolls are extremely overdressed and extremely inappropriate for little girls to play with, in my opinion. Well, um, I mean, I think that not just the, the way they're dressed here, but also this little pose is, I mean, you know, what are they doing there? Like, I mean, it looks like their pimp just dropped them off. <laughs> And so, I mean, I think that there's been a lot of, you know, hullabaloo about these dolls being overly sexualized, given the age group of girls that they're marketed to. And I think that that's right. I mean, you know, um, children are having their first sexual experiences at earlier and earlier ages, like with every passing year. And I think that our culture contributes to that. Which doll would you rather play with, a fat doll or a skinny doll? A skinny doll. Why, why skinny? Because skinny dolls um, are more huggable because they are easy to squeeze. A lot of girls now, like in high school, they like to call themselves Barbie and that drives me insane. Some women who kind of like, they, they see themselves as even more beautiful um, when they can resemble Barbie because what they're looking for, what they're thinking about is about the, the, the kind of perfect, the kind of, um, the proportions and the way that everything is kind of, you know, made to fit this certain kind of um, frame. Does that mean that you want to have this, you know, um, focus on your body and not on your brains or, you know, it really upsets me because I think Barbie has a lot of negative connotations. Barbies, they always look the same, basically, right? So they're taking that as the as Barbie means beautiful. Well, in this contemporary time, Barbie is not so much meaning beautiful. Barbie is more pretty, plastic, um, highly um, generic. When I hear Barbie, actually the first word that pops into my head is anorexia. Unrealistic. Kind of vapid. Bimbo? 
glamour. I mean, so, you know, I, I think you've probably seen these um, sort of extrapolations of like what she would look like if she was a real living woman. You know, like she'd have to be missing ribs. A Barbie doll, as far as like her current dimensions, she, as a grown woman, would not really be, she wouldn't be able to properly menstruate each month and would not be, I believe, therefore fertile. She'd be extremely top heavy and would, you know, fall over. I don't think it made me have lower self-esteem, but I think subconsciously, when I would look at myself in the mirror, I would compare myself to this ideal uh, female body. Dolls like Barbie made me desire to, to have long hair. Dolls like Barbie um, made me desire to have like a super thin waist and that my Ken doll or my husband or my boyfriend would have a six pack, gorgeous teeth and like perfect hair. I think Barbies kind of uh, help girls internalize what they think is like the beautiful ideal body and it's impossible. And the other thing that I thought was interesting about these dolls when they came out in the 1970s, I mean, I think it now, at the time, I just didn't think anything of it at all, is that um, Dusty was white and Skye was black, and they were best friends. Like, that was how they were advertised and stuff, like doing all these sports together and this kind of stuff. And I think that's important, too, because it created the idea that, you know, so first of all, um, young women who were black had a doll to play with that looked like they did, and, you know, but then also these dolls were friends. And so it created this idea of like, oh, well, yeah, of course, we all play together. What do you think, what do you think when you see this Barbie? Could you describe it for me, please? When I see this Barbie, the 2001 doll collection, I believe she is gorgeous. It appears as though she has braids or um, more of a Afrocentric hairstyle. She's glamorous and she's black, so she looks like me with a lot of this stuff is that black girls are expected to identify with it and that's what i find really problematic um, because they don't get to critique it they don't get to say well that actually don't look like me right and why is her neck so, why is her neck so long why is her neck so long right they don't get to ask those questions they just get to see it as you know it's a black doll i should love it and this in a way resembles the kind of girl i probably should be trying to become and I think that part is really problematic. Um, predominantly, the dolls were um, Caucasian. I don't think I've ever seen any other races um, outside of just Caucasians and African Americans, but primarily Caucasian dolls. Those dolls were more prevalent, more available. You know, you had to probably seek out and go to certain stores with different demographics in order to find black dolls, but primarily Caucasian dolls. When I was young, I never had Barbies of color. Like the Jasmine Barbie was the only one that was like a, a Barbie of color. All of my Barbies were white. And so I, when I grew up, when I was about, around 20 years old, I realized that I wasn't white, that I wasn't a white girl. And I feel like some of that had to do with the fact that I always played with white Barbies when I was young. There were some doctors, like psychologists, that did a study where they sort of illustrated how um, young black children of school age were how they sort of internalized racism and how they felt about themselves where where they weren't but they didn't have the same resources as other kids because they were sort of they were segregated and had different resources as far as like textbooks and things like that and so the study sort of illustrated uh they had a white doll and a black doll and so it the questions were asked like what doll do you identify yourself with what doll do you identify as being good, being nice, being pretty? What doll would you like to have? And so basically the results were that black children would prefer the white doll, the white baby doll. And they saw, they viewed the white baby doll as being, um, they valued it more. Now Barbie is a lie, <laughs> Barbie. <laughs> It's a falsified lifestyle. Uh, Barbie just doesn't reflect the different types of women. I think that there is room in our culture for 
dolls that are kind of more adventurous and that you know that give girls an opportunity to play with their dolls doing different kinds of things than just dressing up and going on dates with Ken. The idea of inclusion and what that means. I mean, I think that it's it's still nice to have more options, but the Barbie doll is problematic for both women of color as well as, you know, people who are Caucasian as well. For the younger girls, if they had to play with dolls, I would go back super old school. The Raggedy Ann dolls is filled with cotton and button eyes and, you know, the wool hair. The Barbies that are like about their school, you know, like there's like some Barbies that have like a school uh, book bag. I think kids should make their own, you know, like what do you think a doll looks like? I'm a Barbie girl in the Barbie world, black in plastic. It's fantastic. You can brush my hair. I'll dress me everywhere. Imagination, that is your creation. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. anything that's going on today, okay? Can be different from Mama. Just have a great day. Look at this girl coming through this hallway with the rock with fit on. Nobody wanna go grandma. Everybody wanna walk around and be followers and do the same thing. I choose not to. I wanted the few and I choose to be different. I remember watching anime when I was younger and for me it was just all about the action like I just liked the way they fought and different things like that but now that I'm older I start to see things and notice things and I'm wondering is it more than just cartoons so my question is like what is anime anime is an art form used for telling stories in an audiovisual medium but it's a lot more than that. <laughs> it's like, the only thing I know about Japanese culture is like the hang chang on yon You know, like, everybody joke about it, about Asian culture. So I never really like dug into it. It's very hard to sort of make a joke about anime if you don't know what you're talking about. You come off sounding really ignorant. Mm -hmm. She'd be like, oh, you like cartoons. And it's just like, aw. <laughs> but then when I started watching anime, I don't know. I guess I, get, I have a lot more respect for them and their craft. Some of the inspiration came undoubtedly from American comic books, hence the wide-eyed characters. It's Betty Boop, so it's like the beginning of animation as a, as a medium for storytelling. It started early on, like with the very beginnings of film, like Astro Boy was black and white. I was really influenced by um, cartoons and Japanese artists and the heavy lines and the printmaking and the very stylistic uh, images they would make and how they influenced European artists. Anime was using a lot of Western techniques, but after years went by, anime started to progress and it started to branch off and use its own cultural identity. And then Western animation started using techniques that Japanese anime came up with, or Japanese creators came up with, to, for anime, and they used it in Western animation. Like, you start seeing the, the idiosyncrasies in their behavior, as far as just, like, how they greet each other when they come to houses, like, daily life stuff, geographical stuff. I've seen a lot of interesting looking foods, uh, religious practices. It depends on the type of anime that you're looking at. Any one of the Hayao Miyazaki films is a fantastic way to learn about Japanese culture, because... If you didn't sort of go the extra length 
into actually trying to look into the culture, you probably wouldn't even get a lot of the jokes. Maybe a more natural part of the storyline in the anime stories that I've seen. One time in an animation class, uh, we actually saw a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, uh, the kids having to fight in the boondocks, and it's actually a frame-for-frame -frame, uh, redoing of a fight scene in Naruto. And I just found that really interesting how uh, they take uh, existing footage from anime and make it yeah, have it in a completely new context. And I just found that really interesting to watch. Anime can be looked at as a direct representation of Japanese culture because it has so many small pieces of Japanese culture, tradition, history, and style inside it. The way I've seen just it's presented naturally, like, okay, this is part of our world. Japan, at least what I could tell, going back into antiquity, their history isn't broken. In the 1920s, Japan was working hard to become an industrialized nation, but discrimination towards the Japanese was a big problem, and it led to the deterioration of the companionship between the West and the East. Japan was an isolated island until Commodore Perry opened it to America in 1858. But even after Japan remained mostly closed to many foreign inf influences until the leading up to World War II. In 1924, the U.S. Congress passed the Exclusive Act that prohibited further immigration from Japan. And after World War II, in the 1930s, the U.S. military almost had total control over Japan's government. After Japan surrendered in 1945, the United States instituted sweeping changes in Japan through every aspect of life, such as new constitution, democratics, education, labor reforms, etc. Japan was westernized and they needed a way to form cultural identity, and the Japanese found a way to do that through art. I feel like a lot of anime and manga and pretty much any Japanese art from uh, came after World War II, so it was trying to like reclaim and reshape their identity after what happened to them. Uh, trying to uh, fight for the Japanese culture in a time when, during the American occupation. Japan was westernizing because of the uh, occupation and because of, of the upset of the war. Anime was like a way of escape. I would say it was a chance to keep in remembrance and reclaim their cultural identity. To quote historian Susan Naper, Film and the visual mass media in general can indeed help to write history and create national identity. Culturally, and in, in, in saying that, they, they tend to embrace a lot of their older habits, a lot of their older traditions. In the West, it's always about industry, the industrial revolution, and like conquering nature. But in Japan, it's more of like, it's something you literally have to live with. You have to have some degree of respect for what sustains your own life. In the West, for the most part, they're biased, but with Japanese and Japanese tradition and culture, they, they see everything as equal. You don't, you don't look at just one thing, you need both. You can't just weigh one side heavier than the other. They all both have to be equal and they have to balance out. And that's when Shinto religion comes in. Shinto religion is kind of like the native religion for Japan. I'm not sure how many people are still of the Shinto faith there. It's so ingrained in the culture that it still still pops up a lot. When you think of like Native Americans, they worship um, sort of nature gods. So you have like the fox spirit and the trees all have spirit. And like if you've ever seen any of Miyazaki's work, there's a lot of Shinto woven into the landscape of his his films. The closest one I, I, I can think of at the moment is uh, Princess Mononoke, where uh, it's all about uh, striking a balance between uh, the environment versus uh, personal gain. San, the princess, uh, she just has completely turned herself away from humanity and lives with the animals and wants to be a spirit of nature. And then you have her rival is Lady Iboshi, who symbolizes like industry and factories. And at first glance, it's like she, it would be so easy to like just see her like one-dimensional villain because she is like industry and that's bad. But then she realized like no one is like a clear-cut hero or villain. Customs from feudal Japan are still used now today in Japan, and you can see that in anime whether it's through food or the way they 
greet each other or the way they talk to each other or even the way that they show affection. They, th they think they're cool or just because off habit, you know, like ninjas and samurais. That's, I mean, that's all older Japanese history. But I mean, when you start like looking at, you know, the way they name their characters, it'll be off of like older Japanese generals or you know, older clans and things like that. So they're always digging back into like their history and then pulling that and you and referencing it. That's why if you look at something like Naruto, it follows in certain respects Japanese history where it looks like it could be in a time almost like this. Right. Some of them still kind of dress like it's a feudal era of Japan. Things that happened a thousand years ago still have relevance, still have a place now. When I watched anime, I understood most things, but there were like, also a lot of things they referred to that I've never heard of. And that's when I officially made the connection that anime, when I went further, was more than just a form of entertainment. Anime means that, um, especially now, that it's more than just a specific uh, storyline. That animation can tell hugely complex and adult stories in any subgenre that you can think of. Anime is more than entertainment. I would say it's, it's like a window into another culture. And when you watch anime, you start to see the subtleties and Japanese identity in anime, and it starts to reflect real life. Everything that I know, but it sounds like I read a book. I haven't read books on Japanese culture, man. Yeah. No, I've read, I've read articles, I've read pieces, and the reason I've read those pieces is because there's a cartoon or a movie that made me go, I wonder what this is about. You definitely can learn a lot of stuff from anime, just as, as far as taking it into the context that it is. It's, it's, it's a very Japanese-centric art, and as long as you understand that, you know, it, it may not necessarily be indicative of like life in general, like like this is exactly how it works or all this stuff happens. You know what I'm saying? Are right. you learning world history a little bit about Japanese culture? And that's when the lights start going off and I start going, oh, I saw this and this, I saw this and this, I saw right. this and this, da da, da 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 But all of the this I'm talking about are all anime or manga. So it, it was so the manga anime would have grouped to, to like my curiosity about Japanese culture. And it explained a lot. But when you start looking at, at the basis of things of, you know, either what happened in their history or how they psychologically deal with these things and, and how that manifests in the actual, in the, in the content, then you can start, you start seeing connections between things. So, I mean, if you pay attention, you, you, you'll be able to pick up a lot of stuff as far as like their cultural cues and whatever. Anime refers to a lot of Japanese history, and you can see that in anime, whether it's referred to characters, characters' names, their background, where they're from, or their homeland. How I got into it was funny because um, there, there are two stories to it. It's like, how did I get into watching the style of cartoon versus how did I get into um, searching for this cartoon? A lot of this I learned from Japanese anime. Right. Like, a lot of this came from me watching it all then going, okay, these things are constant. Then messing around and reading something in school, they're going, oh, I already got told about this. Because I was watching an episode of Dragon Ball Z. Right. Or me going from um, calling ramen noodles, ramen noodles to calling it ramen. Because ramen is what it's called in Japan. It's noodles. Right. Yeah, it's noodles. You know what I'm saying? There's stuff like that that I didn't realize or even the technique to like, a, a good bowl of ramen. I learned that from Naruto. So you know how to cook it? I like you give me, like if I get the ingredients, yeah, I'll, I'll do <laughs> the best version I could do not being from Japan right. or having like Japanese friends around, around me to correct me. Anime projects this idea that while you're watching it, it's exclusively fitted for a certain culture. It's like looking out the window into another culture.
Now to give that. Take every advantage. I am confidence, determination, and heart. I am agility, leadership, drive. I am patience, power, and bounce. I am athlete. I am athlete. I am athlete. I am athlete. Michael Ingram and Uncle Vontae Sneed. Every here at West House for the first down your hoops out free throw classic. Check us out every Saturday at 8 p.m. on Channel 19 Can TV. You know, it was fun hanging out with you. Hopefully, we can do it again sometime. Yeah. Oh, look at the time. Free Spirit Media is on. Huh? Ooh. Today on FSM News, we show you how CTA closings will affect your commute to school and work. And prom season is here. Do you have your special dress? So don't go anywhere. FSM News will be right back. Hello, and welcome to FSM News. I'm Lindale O'Connor. And I'm Tanaya Robeson. Why are you listening to it? It's loud. Oh, it is? It, it's just a song I heard. It was made by a student at the Gary Comer Youth Center. Really? Who? Um, well, check him out for yourself. <laughs> The music is my inspiration. Like I've been rapping since I was nine years old. Watching my uncles and his friends on the streets, they just freestyle all the time. And one day I stepped outside and watched they was doing. So I practiced it one day, and then they was out there again. So I just jumped in and did it. Boy, I am the man. Did it? Did you know? Coded in the North Pole. Got a head for my show. Bang roll twenty four inch rim. Got to put them on hold. Well, I do actually have an icon. It used to be Lil Wayne, but then uh, he, it sounded like he was saying the same stuff over and over again, but it's just like all rappers. It affects people in a, in a hype way, like, like I'll say like in a cheeky turn, like what they say, turn up type of way. And like, they just like, once you hear my songs, you want to hear a different one or you want to play it over and over again. <laughs> That's amazing. He really has some skills. I agree. Wait, did you hear that? I think some kids are taking prom pictures. Oh my God, that reminds me. I'm behind on finding a prom dress. Never fear, FSM's very own Anaja Smith is here with the latest fashion tips. Hey you, prom season is here. Do you have the perfect dress yet? Or are you one of those ladies who's waiting until the last minute? Well, don't worry, I'm here to help. Here are the trends. When you go to the stores, expect to see hollow hems, pastel colors, and sequins. Fashion designer Sherry Hill features long-fitted employee dresses that include tulle and lace. On the other hand, Tony Bowles, a Paris designer, suggests shorter designs are in or along with slits. Either way, embrace those long legs. What would you decide? I'm Anita Smith reporting from the Fashion Corner at FSM News.
Pull up. Frank. Headshot. Frank. Sit down. Frank. Stand up. Frank. Pass out. Frank. Wake up. Frank. Fade it. Tonight, Tasha gets arrested for junk driving. That ride home cost her $10,000 in fines. A week later, Tone's mom was found crying because he spent all the rent money on Ciroc and now they've been evicted. Here from tonight, leaving another party drunk, Maya leaves with a stranger and is never heard from again. Don't be dumb, stop drinking. On May 19th, the CTA's red line will start renovation. This means that the red line will completely close from Cermak Chinatown through the 95th and Dan Ryan for five months. They're going to get the first period on time. Here's Xavier Smith with the community's reaction. Beginning in the spring, the rail line will be drastically reducing stations. Many students on the south side of Chicago will have to spend more hours getting to and from school in their extracurricular activities. I'm here on 69th Street at the CTA red line asking people how this will affect their lives when it gets shut down. I have to be at school at 745, so I get up at like 5 every morning to get up here at like 6. And I get to school at 3 o'clock. It's really going to affect me because I don't have a car, and right now I ain't got the financial needs to buy a car. The new service that will be in place for the CTA while it is closed is called the shuttle bus. We asked people how they felt about this accessible, free, new transportation system, and this is how they felt. And then they're talking about putting us on shuttles to get us to where we're going. So a shuttle, you know, traffic the way it is, it's even longer now. They should be putting in more stations to be able to accommodate the, the traveler that they got. It's going to be hard to get to school. It's, it's going to take us a long time, about 20 hours or something. No, it won't. <laughs> probably, it's probably going to take us a good hour to get to school. With stations closing, some people will have to make sacrifices to cope with their increased commute times. I play softball, so my mom probably won't make me, let me do that anymore if I get home too late. And then my grades might go down because I might not be in school at 7.45 anymore. I might have to catch like four buses to school. So I might, I'm going to catch a bus from all the way down Rainbow Beach to all the way in 96, Michigan. As you can see, people are still going to carry on with their daily life activities. However, it will just be more time consuming. This is Xavier Smith reporting for FSM News. Before we go, we have one more PSA. It's about teen runaways. Be sure to pay attention. It may make some young person make a better decision. Why are you coming in so late? I'm just coming to chill practice. What time is this? Does it matter? Yes, it really does. I don't uh, no more worries. Just go to your room. Whatever. So, Ms. Jackson, you're friendly every class you have to serve summer school. You know you're not leaving at the house this summer. Yes, I am. Uh, let's go. I don't like this. I don't think I can do this anymore. This is not the life I want to live. If you are a teenager who has ran away, please go to www.teenliving.org or call 866-803-8336. It's time to go, but we'll be back next time. Wait, we have to tell them how they can find us until then. Oh yeah, I forgot. How can they find us? You can find us on ABC7 Chicago's website under the community section. You can also check us out on Facebook. Search FSM News. Three, two, one. That's, that's a wrap. wrap.
flash thought like this. Come on, they changed it. Good job. Ouch. Where the clap at? You just messed up my car and take it right beside it. Now, Clay, hey! Yeah, I agree. Dang. <laughs> 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 Free Spirit Media cultivates diverse youth voices to transform media and society.